we have a very special Going Green lecture tonight. I don't know that we've ever carried our lecture season over into June. But we're, we're very pleased to have Roger presenting this a climate simulation tool. Uh, I'll just read Roger's bio and I'll let him tell us about the tool and show us how it works. Roger Ingersoll is a resident of the Woodlands. He is a civil geotechnical engineer who after 33, 33 years retired from ExxonMobil where he worked on Arctic, coastal and offshore projects worldwide. During his career, he witnessed significant Arctic changes since the 1980s. He has been a member of Citizens Climate Education and Citizens Climate Lobby here in this area since 2016. He is co-group leader and the grass tops lead for the Texas 08 Woodlands Huntsville chapter. And he is also active in CCL's conservative caucus and the Catholic action teams. Roger has five beautiful grandchildren. So his hope is that Congress enacts meaningful climate legislation as soon as possible to help preserve their future. And uh, Roger, looking forward to it. Okay. Well, thank you, Carolyn. And thank you everybody for sticking around. Um, so I'm going to explain or talk about En-ROADS and En-ROADS was developed by MIT uh, Sloan School of Sustainability. It's a <clears throat> and climate interactive uh, and a climate interactive is actually a nonprofit entity that was an offshoot of the research done at MIT Sloan, um, which started about a, a dozen years ago or so. And it's a cutting edge simulation model that tests climate solutions and generate uh, scenarios for the future. So it's a, it's a great learning tool to let us test various uh, solutions to address the climate uh, crisis. And En-ROADS stands for Energy Rapid Overview and Decision Support. Probably the worst acronym of all time. I don't know why they picked that because it really doesn't, I mean, I know it more or less explains it, but it doesn't really, it doesn't have a, you know, a panache to it. Um, <clears throat> So as uh, Carolyn said, I'm Roger Ingersoll. I'm gonna talk about the problem briefly, just a, just a little bit of the background science. Uh, the assumption is that there, you know, with this crowd, I don't think I'm gonna be talking to any uh, skeptics. Um, so don't have to really convince you of that part. Uh, I'm gonna talk a bit about my background and then get into the simulator and then provide a summary. So atmospheric CO2 is higher than any time in the last 800,000 years. And the levels, levels are increasing faster at an increased rate uh, than any time in millions of years. So we have very accurate measurements of CO2 going back 800,000 years, just basically by coring into glaciers and taking out uh, uh, gas samples within the uh, ice layers. So what you see over the last 800,000 years is like a sinusoidal, more or less rough sinusoidal shaped curves here. And where the troughs are where there are ice ages and where the peaks are when you have higher CO2, that's where you have warm periods. So you can see the most recent one was uh, ice age was uh, about 12 or 14,000 years ago was, was the Holocene. And then you see it rising up to a, a, the normal, uh, but then things kind of change quite a bit. We should be actually sliding slowly back into a, a glacial period right now, but humans and the industrial revolution changed all that. And you can see that now we're at uh, more or less unprecedented levels for from uh, quite a, a long time. So, and as Carolyn mentioned, you know, I worked 33 years at, at uh, Mobil and Exxon Mobil. And I was an Arctic geotechnical engineer for part of my career. Um, I'd say about 20% of my time was spent doing Arctic projects. And one of the things that we're looking at the top of the world here, by the way, and I'm going to show you a time lapse of, of this is a kind of a, a, a screenshot from the time lapse I'm going to show you. But uh, the white here is what's called multi year ice. The ice is mobile, and so it moves and wraps on top of each other and it actually gets quite thick and it, and it can last there for a, a decade or two. And uh, the thickness back when I started my career in, in the early 1980s was about 150 feet thick. But the white portion, when you watch the time lapse, notice that carefully. The seasonal ice 
stuff that goes comes and goes uh, with the seasons is the blue and the dark blue. So this will become more clear when you see the, the video. Um, <clears throat> the ice coverage today is the lowest since sat satellite monitoring started in 1979 and the historical record going back to the 1800s, you know, that goes with trappers and so forth. Uh, and the Arctic may be ice free in September as soon as 2030. And that's uh, quite shocking, frankly. Um, and ice free, that would be the end of summer. It won't be ice free throughout the year because it'll freeze up in wintertime, but at the end of summer, it could be ice free 2030. I've been up there in the early eighties when it never retreated from the shoreline. So you can understand why I'm kind of shocked. Um, <clears throat> the last time it was ice free was more than 200,000 years ago. So uh, pay attention to this video. You can watch the ice volume decrease 75% in 35 years. Basically over my career, it went, I, uh, the amount of ice in the Arctic changed by 75%. So I'm gonna switch this to the video. Pause it for a second. Uh, Carolyn, are you seeing that properly? Yes. Okay. All right, so I'm going to, okay. So we're looking down at the top of the earth. This goes very quickly. It's only a minute long, but it's 35 years. So there's a 1990, you can see that years go by in, in seconds, but the natural uh, motion of the ice is because it's a gyre that the ice spits out over Greenland, you get the icebergs in the North Atlantic. Uh, so through the nineties, we were monitoring this because uh, obviously if we're gonna put structures up there, we wanna know how much ice there was, how much it moved, the speed and how much load it could put on a platform, gouge the seabed and all that kind of good stuff. It was a, I had a great job. This is about when I stopped doing Arctic work about 2004, 2005. So I hadn't seen any of this. So when I pulled up this video and I saw the changes that had happened, I was frankly dumbfounded. Virtually all the uh, multi-year ice, as you can see, is now gone. So, you know, if, if anybody's a skeptic, it's, it's that it can quickly uh, change their mind if they just take a look at that. And you can't uh, deny that that's gonna have some kind of an impact on, on uh, the North, North Americas and the Northern Hemisphere's climate. So why does it matter to me? So here's a graph of showing all the 10 hottest years on record globally. And you notice the, it's from 2005 on. So really, I guess two thirds of the years since 2005 have been the hottest on record when they're, all the recent years are getting hotter all the time. Well, my grandson uh, was born in 2013, and obviously I love him to death. And every single year after his birthday has been the hottest on record. There hasn't been one year that's not been the hottest on record since he was born. And he tells me, Grandpa, I want to go. I want to go scuba diving with you. We look at videos together. He goes, I want to go scuba diving with you someday. And as you all probably know. The coral reefs are being uh, very, very much in, impacted. We've lost 50% of them in the last 35 years. So uh, I don't know what's going to be possible when he gets old enough. So anyway, that's, that's why I'm in and doing what I'm doing. So the global effort to limit greenhouse gas emissions, uh, to go back to the Paris Accord in 2015, that's when the countries around the world agreed to limit warming to less than 2 degrees C, or preferably, if we can achieve it, 1.5 degrees C. So let's go into the simulator, or I'll just give you a little description first, uh, some background on it. It's a transparent, freely available model that gives users the chance to design their own scenarios to limit global warming. So it's, it's completely free. Anybody can use it. You can access it just the same as, as, as I can and anybody else. You test your own assumptions, and you get immediate feedback on likely impacts. Um, and it runs on an ordinary laptop. It's been carefully ground, uh, grounded in the best available science. All parameters and equations are published uh, and have been peer reviewed. And the published equations, if there's something in the model that you don't agree with and you wanna change, you can actually go in and change this. this that's what open source means. You can go in and change things. So it's, it gives you that ability. If you say, I just don't believe this particular part of the model, you can change it yourself. 
It's been calibrated against a wide range of existing integrated assessment models run on supercomputed computers. Those are the ones that we, you hear about, the models that are run by IPCC and some of the world, uh, world scientists. And those models that it's been calibrated against can take like overnight to run or, or a full day or two to run. So that gives you an idea how sophisticated the, the science is behind it. But the model that we're, we're going to use has actually been simplified so it runs faster. And it's also been compared to historical data, which is called hindcast validation. So in other words, if you know, like from 1960 to 2010, we know what the historical data is. So you can then do a, what's called a hindcast. You're not predicting in the future, you're actually matching the past. So if you get a good match, that's a good, good indication that the model's pretty, pretty decent. And obviously the further you go in the future, the more uncertainty you get. So this is just an intro. There's a ton of online training. Uh, there's all kinds of the information available on their website. All I can say is that, uh, you know, I've just scratched the surface because there's, you could spend a lifetime looking through all the information, but you can run your own simulations and dig into this to your heart's content. I like this, uh, uh, the, the Sloan School of Sustainability and, and Climate Interactive uses this often, uh, where think of our atmosphere as a bathtub, nearly full of carbon dioxide. Additions to the atmosphere include like natural processes like decomposition, decomposition of organic matter, volcanoes, and uh, you know, uh, obviously burning of carbon fuels. And at the same time, CO2 is constantly being removed such, such as by photosynthesis, uh, weathering of rocks, absorb, absor uh, excuse me, absorption of CO2 by the oceans. So the problem is since the industrial revolutions, we, we disrupted the uh, equilibrium. The emissions are greater than the removals. So over time, CO2 is built up in the atmosphere. And that's basically, in, in a nutshell, the problem. So uh, the, the simulator investigates both reducing emissions, both sides of the equation, reducing emissions or increasing CO2 removal. And global emission reductions are needed to stabilize atmospheric greenhouse gas levels to slow temperature increase, obviously. And um, natural CO2 removal is insufficient to offset additions in, in the present situation that we're in. Things like afforestation, that's uh, growing of trees and technological advances like carbon capture and sequestration can enhance uh, removal. So I'm gonna run the simulator now. And to find this, this uh, Oh, uh, this uh, homepage for Climate Interactive, I think all you have to do is type in Climate Interactive. Yeah, climateinteractive.org. Um, and this is, the, this is the opening page. And I'm not gonna go into you know, much detail, but basically there's, there's all kinds of links within here. You can, you can join the free on-roads tra uh, on trainings. You can do it live, or you can uh, take a look at uh, 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 recorded sessions. I, I joined the live and it's an eight week class. It takes an hour a week for eight weeks. And I've, I've gone through that training. There's a lot more available. There's plenty of videos and uh, really great information. And the other thing is that these classes are held, at, and what we're doing right now is held around the world. You can see there's, I don't know, 2,400 events and 60,000 participants. So it gives you an idea. This is uh, a very, very robust, if I can get out of this, there we go. So let's just go into the model now. Roger, can you go ahead and maximize your screen that you're looking at? Is that maximized now? Yeah, just as big as you, the bigger the better, a little bit, yeah, thank you. It should be, that's about as big as I can get it. Is looks that? Good. Looks you, good. Okay. Okay, I, there's one caveat that you need to understand. En-ROADS is a global model. So changes that are being made are assumed not, uh, you know, we're thinking of it, I'm, you're like me probably thinking that the changes we're making are United States, but actually what we're actually simulating because this is, uh, you know, because of the complexity of the model, it's a global model. Um, so after all, being a simplified model, the USA does represent a big chunk of worldwide emissions, probably about 25%. So, and I'll talk a little bit at, towards the end about a way to bring the world into compliance. 
But anyway, it's, it's a global model, not one that's just modeling what's going on in the United States. Uh, so this is the standard opening page. You can customize it to show different graphs or table, but I'm just, for, you know, since we don't have a lot of time, I'm just gonna use the standard interface that's shown here. So let's talk on the left side here, energy supply. All right, the, the left column has uh, things like coal, renewables, oil, nuclear, et cetera. And if you look above, this is a, a graph of the global sources of primary energy. So coal is the brown, oil is red, gas is green, uh, blue, renewables naturally would be green, and bioenergy, et cetera. What you're looking at between 2000 and 2020 is historical data for the world supply of global primary energy. So that basically uh, copies or, or uh, it, that is what the world used between 2000 and 2020. From 2020 to 2100 is a prediction of what, what the uh, consumption will be going forward, assuming nothing changes like the business as usual is what they, they term it. So business as usual, if, we, if nothing happens from like, and nothing gets passed in the States or around the world, they're just basically projecting, although you do see a, a growth in green energy that they're predicting, but this is what they're predicting would be the, the energy mix going forward. Some of these things that are really neat about the model, um, you might say, well, what's new zero carbon? So if you go down here and you hit these three little buttons, it brings up it, it brings up all these additional pages that you can look into what the what the details, and what this is is a, a brand new. This is like a a, a a discovery that happens. It's not presently known at the pre, at the present time. A new cheap source of energy or electricity that does not emit greenhouse gases. You can speculate it comes from nuclear fusion or you know other fission. Um, so anyway, and and. These things that are, that are on, and I'm gonna run a new zero carbon. Let's just say that uh, uh, this, the slider is gonna show a breakthrough happens, right? But if you, what this also, the interesting thing about it, if it's a new technology, notice that it doesn't happen right away because there's a certain time period uh, for new technology to be brought up to scale, which takes time then to commercialize it and then actually bring it into the, the you know, actual uh, marketplace. So that's, it doesn't really kick in until 2040, which, which would make sense. But it does, when you kick in the new zero carbon, you can, you can look at what happens and compare it, right, and go, and go back and forth. So the, it, that cuts into other forms of greenhouse gas emissions, and the net impact is, is good for the temperature. Okay, so let's look at this graph here. These are greenhouse, and I'll go back to the beginning here. This is the starting page, or starting uh, situation. So in 2000, the world produced a little over 40, 40 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. And now 2020, we're producing almost 50% more, uh, almost 60 gigatons. You can see they're projecting that to increase fairly steadily until the end, end of the century, if nothing gets done. But going back to the uh, new carbon, new zero carbon example, because the, the, the uh, global sources of energies are reduced, your carbon emissions are reduced, that's good for the, the climate, good for the temperature, and, and improves the situation by 0.2 degrees centigrade. Uh, so that's what this value is. And this is the net emissions. Once again, you can change these graphs. You can look, look at other things, but like, like I said, I'm gonna keep to the home, home screen. Okay, so let's look at the middle column, transport. Transport is cars, buses, trucks, trains, you know, like, uh, and, and, and uh, ships. And so there's two things that you can modify for transport, energy efficiency. If you recall, there's, there are things like cafe standards, the corporate average fuel uh, economy standards that were imposed on the auto industry, uh, was probably 20 to 30, 25 years ago, um, where they, they uh, it was a regulation that made Detroit and the world uh, automakers to come up with more efficient vehicles. So that's what energy efficiency would represent. 
Electrification is the, the transition to electric vehicles, okay? And buildings and industry basically are very similar. Um, energy efficiency, I mean, you can open this up to see what it is. Uh, increase or decrease the energy efficiency of buildings, appliances, other machines, things like well-insulated homes, reducing the amount of energy factories used, you know, et cetera. Um, you can also get into things like growth. I don't, I'm not going to be playing with these too much, but just like uh, for population, it's kind of obvious. I think this projection here is what's uh, the UN project, projects the global population to be about 10.9 billion people in 2100. Well, you can change that. Let's say we're going to put it down to, I don't know, 9.5. Say we're going to have a couple more pandemics. Not that that's a good thing, but uh, it would bring, you see, once again, the the uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduce, which is a net benefit, not a huge one, but it's a net benefit. Um, so, and then let's look at the final column at the bottom. And then we've got land and industry em emissions. There's deforestation, which obviously is not a good thing, it's, but it, unfortunately it is happening around the world. You're not going to want to increase it. That doesn't give you much room to increase deforestation. Let's hope it doesn't increase. But you can decrease the deforestation. And methane uh, is, is from many sources. But uh, it's, it's uh, methane, nitrous oxide. It's the other uh, carbon. It, it behaves like a, a carbon dioxide in the sense that it's a, it's a heat trapping gas and the F gases. The release from cows, agriculture, natural gas drilling, you know, you get leakage from wells and, and waste like landfills. So uh, that's, that's what methane and other is. Carbon removal, there's afforestation, which is the planting of trees and technological things such as uh, carbon capture and sequestration. Um, so the other thing to keep in mind is this is not a precision tool you're really looking at things in a comparative basis. So, uh, you know, a lot of people would argue, might argue saying, oh, I don't believe 3.6. Well, it's, it's a relative thing. You're seeing how one, one policy change affects versus another. And so it's a relative, but I can, I can promise you, as long as this line is increasing, temperature's increasing. So let's run some examples. Um, the first example, and, and in a small group, I would normally kind of go and ask for an example, but this group's too large to do that. Um, so I'm going to look at uh, a couple that, you know, fairly simple and then get into a couple more, a little more complex. But uh, let's look at energy efficiency of this transportation sector. So I want you, since this is a larger group, just I want you to think about this. If I move this slider over, to like maximum energy efficiency, the best that we can expect to achieve, uh, improving cars and trucks and buses and everything. Uh, think about what, what might happen here in the energy mix, and then also kind of in your mind, predict what it will do from a temperature standpoint. So I'll give you a second to think about that. And now I'm gonna move the slider. Okay, so, uh, and then to, easy to see the comparison and go back and forth between the two. So it's a, it's a pretty, it's, it's not as much as we would like, because remember, we want to get to two degrees centigrade. So, but we're only impacting the transport part of the uh, energy mix, right? There's plenty of other things that we're using energy for. So this just the transport, remember. So, so I'm not gonna say that's a bad thing, that's a good thing, but it's just not, it's not gonna solve our problem. All right, go back to the beginning here. Um, the next example, um, a prominent news item is the Trillion Trees Project. Uh, and you've probably heard a bunch about it. Some, uh, some congressmen are saying that's the answer to everything. So that, that falls under afforestation, all right? So I'm going to open this one up to take a look at it because it tells you how they, how they assume um, afforestation. So 
there's only so much land available in the world available for afforestation. And they'll, I mean, if I dug into this, I could tell you what it is, but let's, let's assume we're gonna use like 90% of, let's go to 85% of the available land. So you'll notice over here, net CO2 removals. Keep an eye on that. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. Let's say that afforestation starts this year, right? We're gonna start planting trees now, but you can't assume you're gonna have all the land you need around the world in you know, one year. It's gonna take a, a while. Well, let's, let's say we can do it in five years. So this is the kind of thing you can do. You can change all the assumptions in here. You can say, I'm gonna do, I'm in, I'm gonna plant them in 15 years because I'm gonna use drones. I'm gonna get drones. We're gonna put them around the world, get things planted quickly. But notice what happens here. Here's 2020. Here's the CO2 removal by the trees. And there's a long period here because what happens? Well, it takes you a while to get all these trees planted. It takes them a while to grow. And so then they don't really start sequestering carbon until, you know, significantly until 2040, 2060. And then actually after 2080, there's a tail off because these trees will start dying. Um, so it's not necessarily a permanent sequestration, but it's definitely a good thing. And it is an improvement of 0.1 degrees. Uh, it's, I think there's things I've seen in uh, some congressmen saying that it's gonna take away two thirds of the two thirds of the CO2 that's in the atmosphere. Well, that's simply not true. And actually uh, you can dig up the paper, all the refereed papers, uh, many of them are, are, uh, can be found through links in here. So that, that's the example of afforestation. Um, so, and then, um, Methane is a little more complicated. I don't want to get into a lot of it because frankly, it's harder, much harder to explain. But methane is, is something that if, if we had a, uh, could cut off the amount of methane that's being going into the atmosphere, either through cow belching and uh, swamp gas and things from landfills and, and what the oil industry does, you can get a pretty good uh, response here, 0.4. All right, so I just wanted to use that to just say, hey, there's, there's, there's other things that we can do to improve than just uh, the transport and, and other things. Um, and so let's take a look at putting a price on carbon. I think Carolyn mentioned that I, I represent Citizens Climate Lobby. And for over a decade, we've, uh, we've, we've favored an approach called carbon fee and dividend. It's essentially a tax on CO2 emissions with the money rebated to consumers. I'll talk a little bit more about this later. But the thing that's really cool about this, you know, uh, this program was not developed in conjunction with Citizens Climate Lobby. MIT obviously made this on their own. But you can put in the, our favorite bill, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. It's HR 2307. It's presently, uh, it's, been, it's been released in April and it's in committee right now, but it starts out at $15 a ton of CO2. And that's about, if, for a gallon of gas, for example, that's like 12 or 13 cents a gallon. So it starts out low. It starts immediately whenever the bill's adopted. It's, you achieve the price, the initial price within one year. The final carbon price, it, we up the price, it, it's ramped up at $10 per ton per year, okay? So at the end of the century then, in 80 years, that's another $800, so plus 15. Um, where did I go here? Got myself lost, okay. So it's 800 plus, so it's, it's 815 roughly, the, the cost of the tax at the end of the year. And the year to start achieving the final carbon price, um, is 2021, that's when we start the curve and it's gonna take us 80 years. All right, so this is, this is exactly what our tax is. Starts in 2021 at $15 and by the end of the century, it's off by five bucks or so, but uh, you get the idea. But 
look at the difference that this makes compared to the other choices that we had. We brought it down. We didn't get to the two degrees or 1.5, but we got to 2.5. And look at the immediate impact that we got on uh, reducing coal. And it also it, it, uh, reduces oil and natural gas slower. It kills coal almost immediately because coal is such a high carbon uh, uh, source of power compared to the others. And once you start making uh, other alternatives economic by having a, a, a price on carbon, then renewables take off and take up a huge, much bigger percentage of the carbon, uh, of the um, energy mix. So that, is, that shows the utility of having a price on carbon. And this does, I think I made, uh, this does things incrementally. Yeah, so I can't, it makes it harder to do this back and forth because this is done in steps. Um, but I think you get the idea. So let's take this back to the beginning. Okay, so, uh, well, let's take the, uh, I should have kept the price on carbon. Let's take the price on carbon. I'm not gonna go into the details, but it was roughly that shape. Let's take the price on carbon. Let's say that we're gonna stop deforestation. We're gonna do afforestation. Uh, we're gonna uh, require energy efficiency for cars, energy efficiency for uh, buildings and see what else and methane we're also going to be cutting down on methane emissions and lo and behold what you see is that you can get there it's a challenge and you can't get there with one thing alone but you can get there and so that's what i would suggest that you do you can if you if you're interested in this model and you want to play with it if you're kind of a geeky engineer like me uh it's it's a lot of fun um but that's the kind of thing that you can do. And that's what they do in these interactive sessions with uh, smaller groups. Okay. So I'm gonna take us out of this and go to just uh, kind of wrap up here. But this is the way the bill works, HR 2307. As I said, it, it was reintroduced in 2021 in April, a couple months ago. It's the best first step. You put a fee on fossil fuels at the source, at the well, the mine, or the port, starts at $15 a ton and increases by $10 per ton per year. The interesting thing about this bill though, is it doesn't grow government. All the revenue is returned to households. Two thirds break even or receive more in a dividend check. There's been several studies been done on this and it shows it's not regressive. It doesn't impact the poor. And you say, why is that? Well, uh, if you, if, if you're, uh, it tends that the more wealthy uh, people in the United States, or let's just run a case or just say someone has two Hummers and they uh, keep their house at 60 degrees in the summertime and they have a Learjet that they fly everywhere. Their, their carbon footprint is huge uh, compared to somebody who lives in a smaller house, keeps it at 75 and rides their bike to work. Well, one guy, they get the same check because it's per capita. They get the same check from the government uh, either quarterly or yearly. And the, the one uh, the, with a really high carbon footprint pays into the system, the other one makes money. So two thirds break even. What we're trying to do is change the behavior of the uh, people with high carbon uh, footprints. It's actually gonna have a, really huge impact on businesses as well, not just uh, consumers. The other thing that's important is that there's a border adjustment on goods imported or exported to countries. So if you're an oil uh, producer in Texas and you're sending your, a barrel of oil to Indonesia, let's say Indonesia doesn't have a, a tax, then you get the tax back. You, it, we have to have a level playing field. Or conversely, if that Indonesian company or a company from Indonesia ships a barrel into the United States, then when it hits our port, the tax is assessed, but the money doesn't go back to Indonesia. The money goes to our, our people. So in order to uh, avoid this tax, then the world economies will try to levelize the, the, uh, the uh, everybody would come up with a carbon plan to come up with the same price on carbon. 
So that's the idea of how to get this into the world economy. So when the bill came out in 2019, the Wall Street Journal had a statement from the following economists, 3,400 US economists, four former chairs of all, all living uh, uh, former chairs of the Federal Reserve, 27 Nobel laureates. This is a who's who of all the economists across the United States. And this is what they said. Uh, first, a carbon tax is the most cost-effective means to reduce carbon emissions at the scale and speed necessary. Okay, so that's that 20, HR 2307 fulfills that. The tax should increase until, uh, until emission goals are met. So ours, uh, the, the bill that we favor goes up by $10 a year. And if the emission goals are met, then you can stop raising the price of, of uh, uh, the price on carbon. To protect the US competitiveness, a border carbon adjustment should be established. That's also within the bill. Finally, to maximize fairness and political viability, revenue should be returned to US citizens. As, as the bill is structured right now, that's exactly. I mean, there's other things you can use the money for like infrastructure or so forth. But uh, the way this bill is set up, it's to go back to the people so it doesn't grow government. And there's lots of business support the Business Roundtable came out and said a national market-based emissions reduction policy is critical. Chamber of Commerce said that uh, they wanted a market-based mechanism to bring down carbon emissions. This is kind of a shocker, but it's, they actually, they, they did a 180 recently with a couple months ago. The American Petroleum Institute said economy-wide carbon pricing uh, is a primary tool to reduce carbon emissions. And that was, that was a, a big, uh, change for them. And even ExxonMobil, my former employer, said putting a price on carbon will allow policymakers to eliminate inefficient patchwork of regulations. Regulations really, uh, they, they can be uh, done, if done properly, they do, they're great, but they are not as efficient as, as putting a tax on carbon. So in summary, the insights that I think that we've seen, En-ROADS and carbon pricing, there's no silver bullet no single solution will solve the problem. Second, to achieve two degrees requires silver buckshot. Uh, that's kind of a term that uh, Climate Interactive uses. I, I really like it. And so many successful options uh, together are needed. Uh, the highest leverage is to keep fossil fuels in the ground. Don't, don't let the carbon dioxide get into the atmosphere if it's possible. Um, a carbon price is very high leverage because it changes the fuel mix and reduces the energy demand. And so a good start is uh, the Energy Innovation Carbon Dividend Act 2307. And leading economists and businesses support carbon pricing. So any questions? We do have a couple of questions and I'd like to say thank you. And uh, you've shown us this uh, global tool, this climate simulation tool. and and it's, it's good for us all to think about the things that we can do individually. And some of you may have wondered what your own carbon footprint is. You can simply go to Google and find a simple online tool to think about the things that you're doing in your own household and consider options. And um, so thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to take uh, um, the a question from Emily. Uh, Roger, does Kevin Brady support this bill? <laughs> yeah. Uh, next question. Uh, <laughs> now, now, he, uh, I will say, so I've been involved with Citizen Climate Lobby since 2016, and he's gone from being really uh, not on board to he's got a much more nuanced position now where he's, he's, he's admitting that carbon is uh, uh, human, it's human cause and it's, it's an issue. I think that uh, you have the Republicans more or less banding together to, they, they seem to favor things like, uh, well, the afforestation. And uh, they, they also, they're also really push carbon capture and sequestration. The trouble with that approach is, you know, they, they want to do research on it. It costs money to do carbon capture and sequestration is not free. And when, even if it's coming out of a smokestack from a, a gas plant, you got to capture it, inject it, 
and it all costs money. That's why price on carbon is so important. Um, but I would say that he is not there, and uh, he, but he, his position has softened quite a bit, particularly in the last year, year and a half. But he's, he's no champion. I'm not going to kid you about that. He's not running again. What are the odds? Yeah, somebody else just asked a question about yeah. where are we at numbers wise? Are we close? Is there a chance that because he's basically a lame duck now, he might hop on yeah. at the tail end? Well, we have a meeting with his office in a week, uh, a week from tomorrow, Tuesday. We have our, uh, our annual meeting that we typically would go up to Washington, D.C. and meet face to face, but we're, it's going to be Zoom. So we're, we're going to have a Zoom meeting with his office. Uh, we've been told that there's a, a chance that he's going to actually show up, which is he typically does not. Um, that's a great question. And that's one that I would, uh, I would submit that we're going to try to ask him. Um, so I would think that it, it, the trouble with Washington is, is that they tend to vote in blocks. So he's going to be even though he's a lame duck and you'd think he'd do the right moral thing, perhaps, um, there's still, they, they still vote together on issues like this. So it kind of, you need a shifting of, and Republicans are shifting, but they're not shifting far enough and fast enough so far. Uh, Paul had a question and I think maybe you already answered it, Roger, but let me go ahead and and uh, the question was, have you looked at enough scenarios to determine what the most effective one is and, uh, and are they realistically achievable? I think you, maybe he answered, asked that question before you had gotten to the end of your uh, playing with the tool. Well, I, th I think the one thing that becomes apparent when you play around with the tool is that uh, it really, that there's not a lot of time left. And it's not easy to get to get to 1.5 is very difficult at this point to get to two is possible, but we really need a resolve of, of our, uh, you know, and we need some worldwide things to happen. Um, but I, you know, it is still possible. Will we be able to get achieve two degrees centigrade? I think it's, that's, that's a somewhat of a stretch goal. That's, but that's my personal opinion. Um, but Clearly, I mean, if you play around with the model, the, one of the best things you can possibly do is put a price on carbon. That, that, that is so clear. And, and even in, in the cases that are run in some of these workshops that I've, I've attended from Climate Interactive, um, it, it's, it's very clear that that's, that's kind of the biggest bang for the buck. So, and that's what we're really, and that's why CCL this year, we're putting a real hard push to get, uh, because uh, the Biden administration is planning to do something about, uh, you know, the, the climate problem. And we're really hoping it includes carbon pricing. So that's what we're really pushing for. Roger, do you know how many co-signers the bill currently has? Yeah, it's, I think it's in the around 45 right now. The last time the bill was, was uh, uh, in the previous Congress, they had 90. Uh, at, the, at the same stage, in, within two months, 45 is a very good number, by the way. It's not a, it, just because it's less than before, but the other one had longer time to get co-sponsors. The biggest problem we have right now, all the co-sponsors are, are Democrat. There's not a Republican that signed on to this so far. So that's another thing CCL is working very hard because it's, it, it's kind of like we know that there's many of them that agree that pricing, carbon pricing is the right thing to do. You know, you have Romney and some of the other ones are probably less popular within the party, but uh, there are certainly others that are pragmatic that, that no pricing is, but I think it's getting more than, it's kind of like a herd thing. If you can get two or three to commit and do it, then you can get, and then there, there'll be a block of them that, that'll come over. And that's what CCL is working on right now. Hey, Roger, before we wrap it up, I'd like to give you a chance to say something about uh, the, uh, intern program that you have. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I almost, I almost forgot completely about that. But yeah, we, we uh, this summer, we actually have the most interns we've ever had. So we have any students, we have four interns this summer, um, two that are uh, 
that have graduated and are going to be going off to college this fall and two that are still in school. Um, and we are, we, we love having them. They, they off, we've had outstanding interns. I've, I've been at CCL for, I think five years now. And I think we've had over 10 interns and every single one of them has been outstanding. So it's, it's, and, and basically what we look for is it's, it's a lot of independent study, particularly during the COVID time. And you can get to pick a topic that you want to do your, on your own. And we have a, we give them an opportunity to present it. Like one, one student's doing recycling uh, and she's actually going and visiting some recycling centers across Houston. Uh, another one wants to do environmental racism. Uh, I think a third is doing impact of meat consumption on climate change. And, uh, the, and uh, the fourth one is doing something to do with endangered species. We just kicked them, kick them off for the summer. But it's, it's, uh, it's kind of what the, they want to put into it. And, and it's been a, a great program. I and mean, we've got other things that are going on. Like last year, we had a letter writing program to get out the vote of environmental voters. That was very successful. And our interns really played a big part in that. Any other questions? Well, thank okay. you so much, Roger. We, uh, I'm impressed that uh, we filled the time slot almost perfectly. I think uh, your presentation was well received. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Roger. This was super. Thanks everybody for staying on. Well <laughs> Appreciate That's it, Roger. That's impressive. I'm very, I'm, yeah. I'm very impressed. Thanks a lot for, for being here. Okay. So have a great summer. <laughs>